BBC Four Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. The artistic temperament is a curious thing. It comes and goes beyond our control. It takes different forms among different people. It appears in unexpected places. Sometimes it runs in families, often through several generations. This is the story of two artists, brother and sister, brought up together in a quiet backwater, but whose lives and work were to take different paths. A hundred years ago, Tenby was a small seaside resort in West Wales, a place of beaches and bathing machines, fishermen and holiday makers, with a solid core of middle-class families. One such was the John family. The father was a lawyer from Hafford West. His wife had died when the children were young. And they had a nurse to look after them. Gwen, his second child, was a small, shy girl, and she and her younger brother, Augustus, were the two John children who showed artistic promise and who were to break away from their respectable background. Father John set great store by respectability and stayed aloof from the common life of the town. His greatest dread was to appear conspicuous, but his highest ambition was to be an unblemished pillar of Tenby society. He tried to instill these sound, middle-class values into his children. They were reared on strict Anglican principles, flavoured with a dash of Welsh evangelism. They were taught the proper moral virtues and drilled in the rules of correct behaviour. As they grew older, they resisted, for Gwen had pride beneath her shyness, while Augustus modelled his character on the reverse of his father's, and he succeeded but he spent the rest of his life in search of his lost identity. When he was 16, he was sent to London from Victorian Tenby to the sophisticated world of the Slade School of Art. It was to be a revelation. For the first time, he saw in the flesh things that before he'd only imagined. He came upon new sensations, new ideas, new problems. He was lonely, shy, and uncertain of himself. His first visit to the life class filled him with wonder, which deepened to confusion when he saw the model. He worked hard, but his drawings were methodical and unremarkable. Then, in his second year, there was a transformation. His drawing, almost miraculously, became strong and sure. There was no uncertainty now, and his eye and hand worked together without hesitation, quickly and decisively, translating the complex form of the human body into drawings that were compared with those of the old masters. His teachers were astonished by this prodigy. Even the stern and critical Henry Tonks declared that Augustus was the best draftsman since Michelangelo. And it was not only his drawing that was now transformed. From that shy, country chrysalis emerged an outrageous, amorous, unconventional personality. He adopted a bohemian pose, and before he knew it, he'd become a cult. At this time, too, he found his other lasting refuge in the comfort and company of women. Woman is beauty, he once said. Every artist loves beauty, therefore an artist must love women. A simple equation that became a compulsive principle. So his two obsessions, art and sex, merged and became a legend of the Slade. His painting was not so wonderful. He struggled to achieve with a brush, the mastery that came so easily with a pencil. And in his last year as a student, he won the annual painting prize with this large composition, Moses and the Brazen Serpent. It was Augustus's tribute to the old masters, 
Rembrandt, Rubens, Michelangelo and El Greco mingled uneasily in a mass of writhing paint. It was a foreboding of another of his lifelong problems, the struggle to find his own style of painting, keeping pace with the search for his own way of life. But Augustus enjoyed the social life at the Slade. Though very formal by later standards, there was always a flock of beautiful girls waiting for the amorous predator. By now, Gwen had joined him there. But while Augustus was usually at the center of events, she seemed content to remain in the background. She had much in common with him, but she chose to hide her feelings behind a shield of pride and restraint, and while she retreated to defend herself, he advanced. So perhaps it was this difference in their strategy that made him so overpowering, for she found it difficult to work near him. In spite of this, the two of them lived together for a while. It was a life of cellars and basements, which Gwen, to his despair, seemed to like. He had his love affairs to cheer him. He was by no means constant, but he was certainly ardent. His roving eye fixed on a friend of Gwen's, Ida Nettleship. Augustus was bowled over by her calm beauty. He painted her, courted her long and painfully, and then, to the dismay of her family, married her. Augustus, untidy, dirty, sometimes violent, often drunk, and always unreliable, was no great catch. But Ida adored him, and cheerfully set up home for her dear Gus. When the children began to arrive in quick succession, she sacrificed her painting to care for them. But life with Gus was never easy. Normal domesticity never suited the Johns, and Gwen, perhaps wiser, never tasted it. She was free to go where she chose. In 1903, with a friend, Dorothy McNeil, she set off for France to walk from Bordeaux to Rome. They lived simply and travelled slowly, for Gwen wanted time to paint. She was single-minded about her work and a perfectionist, and though she never shared her brother's premature fame, she was equally talented, as her biographer Mary Taubman explains. One has the impression that she was quite a mature, very mature draftsman by the time she was in her early 20s. And then gradually began to develop a study of the single figure. But at first her painting was very thin, fluid paint. Um, one has the impression that she probably learned a great deal of the old master's technique. But who she actually looked at as a student, it's hard to know. One thinks she must have looked at the Dutch and Flemish painters. I think the single greatest influence on her as a painter must be Whistler. Gwen came to know Whistler in Paris, where she studied at his academy. His methodical style appealed to her, and she refined his methods to a point where only she could understand them. The two girls had abandoned their walk at Toulouse and Gwen was now living in Montparnasse. Gwen spent the rest of her life in France, in self-exile and growing isolation, content to live without the comforts of life, to relinquish everything but the bare necessities that would allow her to paint without distraction. And in these cheap lodgings in the back streets of Montparnasse, she found a freedom that Augustus searched for in his many wanderings about the world. She wanted to be free of his influence, and so she framed her own pattern of solitary life. She lived very, very frugally, but she speaks interestingly about her room, as if it were a place that she liked to be happy and she liked to have it in some kind of order. I don't think we have to think of her as someone living in a hideous bohemian mess. She, she kept her room, I think, rather neat, pretty. She had flowers and uh, she talks quite often in her letters about doing, doing out her room, making it look nice. But anyhow, the general picture is that she was living very, very frugally. There is an austerity, of course, about her paintings, which 
is simply another aspect of this austere life. Her way of life was also an expression of her independence. To keep herself, she started to pose for other artists in the studios of Paris. Augustus, ever helpful, suggested that she pose for Rodin, who was said to favor English and American girls. Rodin willingly took her on, for he always needed models. He was 63, and the greatest living sculptor, the greatest, it was said, since the Renaissance. He poured out an endless stream of work. The man of genius is a stallion, he declared, who creates with nature. So it was with his life. Gwen had fancied herself in love before she met Rodin, but this was overwhelming. Her reserve melted, and she fell deeply in love with him. But to him, she was one of many women. His sexual appetite was prodigious and uninhibited. A young girl delivering Prince was rudely shocked. His beard and hands, she explained, were all over me. But like all reputations, it hid the real truth. While Gwen was his mistress, he cared for her and admired her in many ways. She has a beautiful body, he told Augustus, and he posed her for this monument to the memory of Whistler. This was, I think, the most important relationship in her life, a very tragic one in some ways, in that she, being the passionate girl that she was, uh, allowed herself to become more and more obsessed by her feeling for Rodin. But Rodin, I, I imagine, couldn't reciprocate the sort of demands that she was making on him. Um, he, he was marvellously tolerant and friendly throughout this very long period when she was writing him passionate letters of great devotion and obviously was very fond of her, really cared a great deal about her, worried about her health, paid her her rent as far as one can see, paid her rent for many, many years, worried about her cat was obviously very concerned that she should look after herself. Augustus also worried about Gwen, but his life was too full to do much about it. He'd met John Sampson, an authority on the gypsies, and Sampson had taught Augustus the Romany language and taken him to their camps. It was the life Augustus thought he wanted. It was free and easy. On the open road, there were no demands on him, no responsibilities. He wanted to escape his responsibilities, for he'd fallen in love yet again. He was disturbed, for this time it was more than a passing excitement. She was to have a profound effect on his whole life. It was Dorothy McNeil whom he'd first met in the second year of his marriage. Almost inevitably, he was fascinated by her, and he bombarded her with letters, poems, demands and entreaties. He gave her pet names, Ardor, Dodo, Dorelia and he begged her to live with him. But she was a friend of Ida's, and since Augustus couldn't hide his feelings, Ida was unhappy and confused. But she loved Gus, and what he wanted, she wanted for him. Then Gwen took command of the situation. She wrote to Dorelia, you are necessary for Gus's development and for Ida's, was the sum of her long argument, and he is necessary for yours. It was all too much for Dorelia, and she surrendered. Augustus went to claim her and took her back triumphantly to share his restless life with Ida. By now he had his studio in London, a house in Essex and his caravans. Ever since childhood he'd envied the gypsy way of life, so superior to the confined respectability of Tenby. It was now fashionable to admire the gypsies. Edwardian romantics sat in their comfortable homes and dreamed of the Romany way of life. But Augustus had no patience with dreams. What he wanted, he set out to get. So in 1905, he took his caravan to Dartmoor, and here in the spring of that year, 
Dorelia's first child was born. Ida, always compassionate, came to help her, and the two women washed and cooked and cared for their children while Augustus painted. They were happy in a way, but the reality was not as enchanting as the dream. That autumn, they moved their strange menage to the more tolerant atmosphere of Paris. Augustus was often away working in London, but Gwen was near, and the sister, wife and mistress tried to make what order they could out of Gussie's legacy. Augustus came when work allowed, though he had mixed feelings about his family. Certainly he liked them as models, especially the children, quick and lively, like this drawing of Casper, his second son, who remembers his father in those days. He always liked to have children around, plenty of them, not necessarily his own, but other people's as well. He, he enjoyed children to that extent. And um, he uh, was never a warm-hearted man, really, to us. He was a tremendous sort of... Um, difficult fellow to, to understand for a kid. In fact, I don't think he ever understood himself come to that. Perhaps he never understood Ida. Calm, tender, tolerant and loving Ida, she lived for Augustus. To her, he was a child of nature and a genius, and women must allow such creatures their freedom. But a week after their fifth son was born, she died in a Paris hospital and her patience and wisdom were gone. No one knew how Augustus felt about it. They were shocked when he rushed out and got drunk, and only Gwen and Dorelia saw the grief he rarely felt. Without complaint, Dorelia took on the responsibilities of the double family. This also meant posing for Augustus, which he did for over a thousand drawings and paintings, and she was the inspiration for some of his finest work. There were also seven boys to look after, Augustus's moods to cope with, and all the other problems of a large family in no settled home. In 1911, they rented Alderney Manor in Dorset. They parked the caravans in the grounds and seemed at last to have come to rest. They still lived like gypsies, but they couldn't ignore conventions. And there came a time when, as Romilly John says, they had to compromise with the outside world. We wore pinafores and uh, had our hair bobbed, which I suppose was unusual in those days. Uh, but it didn't seem to affect us at that time. I don't think we, as children at first at any rate, we weren't aware that there was anything odd about it. My mother, as a matter of fact, drove down to Parkstone, which is a neighbouring place, and. Uh, to the school and drove up in her pony trap in front of the school and Mrs. Pooley, who was the headmistress, came out and Dora said, well, I have some children I we want educated. Do you think you could take them on? Uh, uh, and Mrs. Pooley said, well, how many are there? And Dora said, well, I have three, but there may be one or two more <laughs> who will come a bit later. <laughs> if their appearance was unusual, at least Augustus made artistic capital out of it. More than any other artist in history, he painted his own family. Perhaps it was his way of showing affection for them and for the simple way of life. The years before the First War were a period of great activity for him. It was at this time that he returned to his homeland to paint the landscape of North Wales. He went with a friend, another Welsh painter, Dick Innes, Innes was younger than Augustus and burning with the energy of a consumptive. He took Augustus to Arenig, a mountain he loved like a woman. I seemed to detect, said Augustus, a certain reserve on his part. He was experiencing the scruples of a lover on introducing a friend to his best girl. They found this small inn below the mountain. It was a place that pleased Augustus, for there was singing and drinking in the evenings with Welsh jigs played on the fiddle. And in the bright sunshine, there was the mountain to paint. In the mountains of Wales, Augustus found a freedom that had gone from the cities. 
For him, it was a country of blue skies and green moors, the haunt of the gypsies, where he could escape for a while from the modern life that at heart he detested. Fired by the example of Innes, Augustus painted straight from nature and caught the light and colour of the distant horizons that he could never reach. Augustus returned to Dorset, but he could never be still for long. It seemed as if he didn't know what he wanted, where he wanted to be, or what he wanted to paint. In Dorset he found the blue pools, strange, deep, turquoise waters, and on them he built a large painting that expressed his unrest. Some say that it is his masterpiece, and he called it Lyric Fantasy. It is an allegory of happiness with beautiful women and bright children and it represents an impossible dream with no conflicts and no doubts. But fantasies can't earn a living, so Augustus plunged into the world of cities and exhibitions again. And in a way he liked it, for it was another form of escape. It was just that he couldn't decide which way of escape suited him. So he was glad to be invited to Ireland. He went to Galway, to Lady Gregory's house. She'd asked him there to paint Yeats, the poet, and Shaw, the playwright, who were the leading lights of Cool Park. He was becoming known and wanted as a portrait painter. He painted the famous in politics and society. His astonishing talent, quick and vital, was the delight of the fashionable world, and he gave new life to portrait painting. He was conscientious, sometimes inspired. He tried to capture the spirit of his subjects, and if they were sympathetic, he succeeded. Sometimes the work was routine. The fame of the sitter was no guarantee for success. And fame was catching up with him. The rebel was being tamed by success, and the Royal Academy beckoned. But he had one more way of escape, to a place known and dear to him. Ever since his early days, Augustus had been intoxicated by Provence. As if in answer to the insistent call of far-off Roman trumpets, he wrote, I set off one early autumn for Provence. The classic lands had for years been the goal of my dreams. It was a country of olive groves, vineyards, and the white speckled hills that he loved to paint. It was the country of Cezanne and Van Gogh. It was the romantic land of the Greeks, the Romans and the Gypsies. One day, on a train to Marseille, he'd seen a great inland lake with a town rising out of the water. It was Martigues, and he'd found, he said, an anchorage at last. The lake was the Etang de Bear, and Martigues was a small town of fishermen, artists and gypsies, with small boats, many cafes, and few tourists. It suited his varied tastes, for it was also near to the Riviera with its fashionable society. He decided to find a house in Martigues and to paint there. But progress caught up with Augustus and with Martigues. The tourists, the last and most formidable of invaders, were overrunning Provence. And the Villa Saint Anne, the house he found where he painted his most brilliant pictures, was being swamped by a new landscape. Industrialization came seeping in. It was too much for Augustus and it meant another escape. With Dorelia, he searched for another house to the north, near the Roman ruins of Saint Remy. Here they found a small farm, the Mas de Galeron. It was a simple place, and it had a vineyard and splendid views. The younger children stayed here, and Poppet, the eldest daughter, 
was one of them. He, he took this little house for five pounds a year. Literally, it had no water. We had to get it from the vines. There was a little well. And he was very, very happy here, living in complete simplicity. Augustus liked the simple life at intervals, just as he liked his family around him when he was in the mood. Life with father could be pleasant if the mood didn't change. He was a very changeable man en, en famille. Sometimes very amiable, very jolly, and very happy person to be with. Other times, this great gloom came over him, which completely took over the whole, whole of it. We couldn't do anything against it. He was extremely strict at table, and we as children were hardly allowed to say a word, which resulted in one of us getting the giggles, which was fatal, <laughs> because that infuriated him. Children were to be seen and not heard. Perhaps, I don't know why, but perhaps it was because of his own very strict upbringing with his father, who was puritanical. And maybe he felt he had to be strict because of his own rather gay life and what he did, thinking perhaps we'd all follow too soon in his footsteps, perhaps. He certainly was very strict with us. I just remember a very cosy atmosphere in the nursery. His other daughter, Vivian, says of her childhood. My sort of earliest memory of him was of great fear and alarm. I had a sort of figure of him standing in the doorway as a silhouette. And this produced a state of alarm, which I think I've kept my entire life. He was over life size in, in, as, as a personality. And uh, I honestly don't think he could be otherwise. He might have wanted to be a little bit anonymous occasionally, but I don't think he ever brought that off. As soon as he came into the room, whether it was a restaurant, you just Everybody became conscious that there was something there that was quite out of the ordinary. This something needed a place of its own to flourish. So Augustus built this studio in Chelsea. The, the main feature of the house, of course, was a big studio at the back, uh, where he did an immense amount of work. It, it was absolutely littered with canvases, all oil paintings, I think. I don't think he did much drawing there. He was painting more portraits, I think, there than any other time of his life, and also giving the most marvellous parties in the evening, which great many celebrities came to, like Tallulah Bankhead, who used to turn cartwheels in her knickers, which dates the time in the studio, and Hutch played the piano. And there was this sinister figure, Alistair Crowley, very often there, who my father drew quite a lot of pictures of. Very frightening man in his cape and his black hat. There used to be large gatherings of p p parties, I think they're called uh, do's or something, when um, these, all these creatures came around. I suppose they were all bohemians, I don't know. But there's a lot, there was a lot of going on then. He was at, a, at, at what I suppose the peak of his, of his um, professional career. The immense amount of booze, wine, women and song, and, and, and occasional collapses and disappearances. I think there was much more to him than just um, uh, wearing odd clothes and striding up and down uh, King's Road in Chelsea. Um, an extremely complicated, complex uh, character. I, I don't think really knowing which way life led at all. I think he was sort of experimenting the whole time. 
trying to find out what the hell it was all about. While Augustus was still searching, Gwen seemed to have found a way. In 1913, at the darkest time of her affair with Rodin, she became a Catholic. I think she had a kind of need to be in a position subservient to some greater being. And Rodin had fulfilled this need to a certain extent. Uh, she was suffering a great deal from her relationship with Rodin and the fact that it wasn't reciprocated. And I imagine, though this is only speculation, that this may have had something to do with her turning towards Catholicism. It could also have been a final rejection of her Welsh upbringing, or it could have been a desire to find an order for her passionate nature, as she had found an order for her painting. She now lived in Meudon, near Paris, and close to Rodin. And in the nuns of Meudon and their church, she found the tranquility that she needed. The sisters wanted their neighbor to paint religious subjects for them, but she preferred to make these small sketches of the nuns and the orphans of the convent. Since she spent a great deal of her time in church, I suppose she simply went on drawing there as she drew everywhere else, in the train, on the street. Uh, but she got one gathers into a certain amount of trouble and difficulty over that, and the, the curé of Meudon was not very happy about the fact that she was drawing in church. Uh, but she defended herself, and she said that she drew only at certain times in church when the less important parts of the mass were in progress. And she didn't see why this should be called a sin. She didn't feel it was sinful. But she did develop a curious humility. I am a little animal groping in the dark, she told Augustus. This humility was inverted pride and another form of neglect. Augustus worried about her. You must change your room, which is too damp and gets no sun, he wrote. So she bought a piece of land nearby, which she left to her nephew, Augustus's son, Edwin. She had a couple of shed, small wooden huts in, the, in her garden, which was quite a big garden. And there she lived. She should be, seemed to be quite contented to live in this one room. Or actually, I think it used to be a, used as a garage before she moved in. But uh, this is where she lived, in a wooden single room. With her cats, Gwen lived and worked in her shed, sublimating her feelings into a devotion for God, for women friends, and for her cats. She didn't encourage visitors, but she finally agreed to visit Augustus. She could not bear to leave her cats in Paris. She couldn't make the necessary arrangements. But evidently she did make them, and, and sure enough, she did arrive. And, the, and unfortunately, there were rather a lot of other guests in the house at the time, which, as she was extremely shy, she, it made it necessary for her to have her meals in, in her bedroom. And, and I, I remember her very well, really, because I was terribly struck by her appearance. So very like my father, but very, very tiny, like very miniature, Augustus, but with eyes that filled with tears almost continuously as she talked. Very, very pale, bluey eyes. And she wore dark, dark clothes. Gwen had one other love, the sea. It was perhaps memories of Pembrokeshire that drew her to Brittany, and every so often she would venture from Paris to this little town of Val Andre. Here she found this chateau. It was derelict then, but it was secluded, and that suited her. She rented a room here, for it was near the sea where she liked to bathe. She was content and she was working. In Brittany, she did very little painting. It was mostly drawing that she did. Uh, and she refers quite specifically to this in some of her letters, saying, I don't feel that I want to paint in Brittany. I, I haven't been painting, I've been drawing. And she had as models uh, the children from the local school who used to pose for her after they came out of school wearing their black pinafores. Uh, they would go up and sit on the edge of the cliff and she would draw them using charcoal mostly, drawing very quickly. Uh, 
one drawing after another. I've talked to quite a number of these women who were little girls at that time who describe how she drew and drew and drew very fast and she paid them a few centimes and they were very happy to earn a little pocket money. And in some curious way, it seems as if these children were the ideal models. They somehow seemed to touch a chord which she exploited. I, uh, my feeling is that some of these drawings of the children in Brittany are among her very best and indeed among the greatest drawings um, of the century. Very beautiful, tender, detached. The responses that Gwen could not get from people, she found in her religion and in her art. She could control paint in a way she could not control feelings. She narrowed down her vision, refining it to one limited view. She developed a personal system with cryptic notes about shapes and tones, and she ignored the artistic revolutions going on around her in Paris. Yet many people admired her work, Augustus among them, and they urged her to sell it and to exhibit more. But though she was proud of her work, she hated to let it go. In her very last years, we have the impression that she painted very little, hardly at all. I think possibly because she was ill. I don't think one can talk about her having uh, a final phase which was less good than her earlier phase. I think she simply stopped working in the last eight years of her life. She was so run down and uh, finally she was persuaded to go to Dieppe to sort of have a little change of air and perhaps pick up a bit. But it was too late. She died. Well, she arrived. She was collapsed uh, in Dieppe in the train, and she had to be taken straight to the convent hospital, where she died three days later. Augustus lived on quite a different level. He was flying high. He was now a public figure with a place in the country, Fryan Court in Hampshire. But he needed people around him, and the house was often full. Well, for us, it was a wonderful time because we had our ponies to ride, and we were near the river, and we could swim. And every evening, every weekend, it was like a kind of car park outside. People drove up, people came for all these free drinks that he doled out, literally half pint glasses of whiskey, undiluted with either water or ice. So of course he stayed on and on and on. And then a time came when he got frightfully bored with the whole thing and relapsed in silence. And still nobody went. So my mother used to ring the bell for dinner, the cow bell. Still nobody moved. And one day Gustus got up and he said, must you stay? Won't you go? And within five minutes, the <laughs> room was empty. They'd all disappeared. We were allowed to have our dinner in peace. To support this way of life, he had to work. It was a necessity, but it was also an obsession. It was his own security among the distractions of the world. He still searched, with growing pessimism, for his true style, the clue to his real identity. In his two studios, set apart in the grounds of Fryan Court, he was painting mainly portraits, either commissions out of necessity, or of his family, for the love of it. Well, when we were children, it was absolute agony because he came down every morning while we were having our breakfast and he looked around the room and we all cast our eyes to the floor, hoping not to catch, be caught. And yet there was some sort of awful thing which drew one. Well, looked up and caught the eye and he said, 10 minutes in the studio. And we knew our whole day was absolutely ruined. We had to sit and sit and sit. An extraordinary uh, piercing eye, intense, uh, um, in involvement in what he was doing. N nothing sloppy. And you would be seated on a stool or on a bench or whatever it was, on standing, sitting, and uh, you, you would be very carefully positioned. Angle, uh, lighting, height, and all the rest of it. And you would have to sit there absolutely still or stand absolutely still. Uh, and then there would come the mixing of the paints and the palette and so forth. And so forth. 
And I, I think he, he started usually by, uh, with, a, with a fairly light um, colour, oil colour, outlining the, the sitter, victim, you may say. And then he would start to fill in, of course, with, the, with all these paints and so forth. And uh, if you shifted from your position, there was, a, there was a hell to pay. And he would use a brush to redirect your eyes or your angle or, or, or whatever it was he'd seen had gone wrong. You had shifted. And, uh, of course, that one was absolutely rigid, you know, for about an hour. And then the magic word would be rest. <laughs> Which meant, of course, you could dismount and you could walk around and you could re re reintroduce your uh, circulation of blood and all the rest of it. And um, hoping that it would be the one rest of the day, but no, you were recalled and so it went on. After sitting all the morning, which could be quite tiring for a very young person, we'd have lunch and um, if we were lucky, He'd choose something, something else would catch his eye for the, after, for the afternoon, perhaps a cineraria or a clematis. My mother sometimes went down to the village to buy him a flower to concentrate on for the rest of the day. Anyway, he'd work all afternoon. And even after tea, he'd sometimes walk back again to the studio, wherever he happened to be working at the time. There was one rule, which was that there were to be no onlookers. This was, a, this was a major rule. He always painted alone, he and his sitter. Except, I know once, my personal knowledge, when he was painting Dallin Thomas from Swansea. And uh, I was commissioned to keep Dallin Thomas's mug full of beer. So I had a front row in the stalls to watch the outgoing tide of beer, you know, to replenish it from time to time. That's the only time I, I was ever allowed to participate in the, my father's paintings. I'm not a fashionable portrait painter. I much prefer painting my friends or people I happen to meet. When he said that in 1957, Augustus was no longer a fashionable painter. For modern art had passed him by, and he'd become a traditional artist. I don't think there was much mystery about how he worked. He, he just painted away, direct. He, he was a direct painter, put it on and like that, and left it. Those were his most successful portraits when he didn't spend too long on them. His work to him was really meant more to him than anything in his life. But whether he really was happy with it, I don't really, I can't tell. I only know that he always felt he could do better and that he always tried harder and he always worked every single day. Inspiration. It's all very well, but it's hard work which makes the difference. But it takes more than hard work to make a good painting. The light and life had gone out of his work and he was running down. Augustus knew it, though he kept on trying. As an artist, you've got to get excited before you can do anything. And beauty is a great excitement. Certainly I have interest in women. If it's beauty, it's love, in my case. <laughs> One is excited over certain aspects of life more than others, and one becomes, so to speak, inflamed. Sadly, the flame had died away. His last painting was a celebration of the gypsies and their patron saint in the Camargue. It was an escape from time, from old age and civilization. It was a yearning for his heyday, for the nomadic life and the brilliance of Provence. But he knew it was a failure. Fifty years from now, he said, I shall be known as the brother of Gwen John. There was one more way to the past. As his age increased, so did his affection for Wales. He went there when he could, driven by nostalgia for the landscape. And one of his regrets was that he'd never learned the language. I wish, he once said, that I had never left Wales. I think he wanted to go and live his last years there. 
It's rather sad because somehow my mother was a little old and she didn't feel like making the effort to... I think he'd seen some wonderful castle, but it hadn't got a roof and she didn't feel quite up to and tackling that sort of thing. So he never really got back to live there. But that's what he wanted. He never stopped working. In fact, he died from work. He, he, he died from uh, congestion, chest, because he, he, he had this little studio in the orchard and he was working away. And he went out in a gale of wind and uh, rain, inadequately costumed for the elements and uh, caught this chill. And uh, he, he, he got back and, and, and congestion took over, pneumonia and all the rest of it, and he never recovered. But he, 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 he worked. I've never known a man work so hard when he was well. Absolutely ceaseless toil the whole time. Uh, he never, 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 never stopped. And the machine ran down in the end, of course. 31st of October, 1961. Augustus was 83, but it was too soon for him. Give me another hundred years, he'd said, and I would become a very good painter. He didn't need his hundred years, for he had been a very good painter, only he'd never stopped to notice it. It was in his thirties when, as a young man before the First World War, he'd painted these landscapes of Ireland and Wales, of Dorset, Normandy and Provence. The like of them had never been seen before in English painting, and they rivaled the best by European masters. For a short time, it looked as if these small paintings offered a fresh hope for British art and that Augustus would lead the way to new discoveries. But he could not control his wayward talent or resolve the conflict within him. The fire of his inspiration burned out and he was left angry and unfulfilled. And he would sit and stare at his sister's paintings as if to discover there the secret he had missed. Was Gwen with the same problems, the same upbringing and the same talent, any wiser. Augustus thought so, and though he deplored her life, he envied her paintings. Her talent was like a stream, which, with both pride and humility, she turned into a fountain, a fountain that flowed quietly and steadily, pouring out drawings and paintings. She controlled her life, and through it her art, which owed little to any other artist in which she patiently moved towards her own kind of abstraction. The people she knew, the things she owned, the room she lived in, these became the substance of her paintings. She dwelt on small things, but she did not see them in a small way. In her exile, she tried to create her own vistas and forget the landscapes of her youth. But though Gwen and Augustus traveled a long way from their beginnings, it's doubtful if they ever left them behind. <laughs> 